Okay, design goals for today. Shameless Gonzo Onslaught of Color. With a wizard's lair, we are after spectacle through blunt force trauma, not taste and technique. There are no wrong answers. It's a kitchen sink kind of day. So thanks for joining me and let's get started. You know, I'm nothing if not a person of consistency. And so unsure where to go next in this series, I posted a poll asking what you all wanted to see next and you chose a blacksmith workshop. So naturally, here is how to do a wizard's laboratory. And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all True Tiles lines. Start out with something real easy. Look at all these beads. These are just from one of my raids to Michael's or Hobby Lobby. I can't remember which, but these will make perfect urns. And arguably they're good as is. You can just glue them down, but eh, I don't know. Let's paint them. God's gift to humanity, Rust-Oleum 2X flat gray primer. Then I painted them with a base coat, washed them, and did all the trim with metallics. My intent was to cluster these together and attach them so they'd be like one piece of scatter terrain, but you'll see later on that's not what I ended up doing with them. How about a scroll rack? Initially I thought, let's make this sort of like a, a wine rack where you have the diagonal cross hatched members creating cells where you store the things. And I began with these little wooden dowels or toothpicks and I started gluing them together until I realized, oh, that's f only going to frustrate me tremendously. But then I remembered I had these things in my junk bin. They've been there for like five years. I'm so glad I held on to them because I think that plating a few of these together, attaching some cardboard on the outside, priming it up and painting it, this makes a perfect scroll rack. A couple wood planks on the top and bottom to round out the look, and maybe a decal on the side. Scrolls I covered back in the loot and treasure video, so I'm not gonna rehash that ground here. You can go watch that video if you want to. Now I don't expect that all of you would have this random plastic bit that I happened to find, but as I'm sitting here recording it, I'm just brainstorming ideas. You could take an office hole punch and punch holes in chipboard or cardboard, make two such slabs and then attach them together so that they have some depth. You would just have to be real meticulous about spacing. Or maybe you could take some cross-stitching mesh, granny grating, and cut out every other uh, cross so that you basically quadruple the size of each square hole, then turn it 45 degrees and somehow mount it on something. That would make a good wine rack or scroll rack. In the last video, I cited Dark Matter Workshop, and I'll do it again here. To make some little jars of material, I'm going to raid this Denon DVD 2200 player Probably the first thing I ever bought with my own money. Plays SACDs and DVD audios as well. It was the hotness for its time. Today it'd probably be 10 bucks. Anyway, I harvested these little capacitors from it, cleaned them up and spray primed them. And again, for speed and smoothness, I used my airbrush. A brownish and a yellowish color for the actual clay of the pot. Then a wash. As always, I recommend Army Painter washes. I think they're the best in the game. Dull those down and accentuate that crevice that goes around the rim. Then I picked a few colors and just flooded the top with paint. Very, very thick coat. So much that it covers up and obscures those two little prongs that are left. And there we go. Jars. Now again, a few videos ago, I covered furniture and how I build it and how I paint it. Basically, I use these Jenga blocks and jumbo popsicle sticks with a couple of select colors that are my go-to. I'm not gonna revisit furniture here. You can watch that video if you want to. But I did take the opportunity to try a different color. For this one bench that's gonna be like an apothecary table, I gave it a deep burgundy finish just for the fun of it. But here's one new furniture idea. How about a little podium for the wizard? I use this square dowel cut at an angle for the main post and jumbo popsicle sticks for the top and bottom. Some other wood as a ledger for the book to be resting on. And then the book itself, again, I did a video a while back on books. You can revisit that video if you want to. So the book goes there and then uh, I'm gonna bejewel it. Likewise, there's this weird teardrop shape bit that I found in my wood collection. So I made a weird looking table for that. Kind of looks like it defies gravity a little bit. And I imagine this as a scrying table. So the orrery that we're going to build in a moment here, you can rotate that and tune it to whatever plane and location you want. And then it appears on this table for you to scry upon. More potions. You can never have too many potions. These are made the same way I made my wine and brandy bottles in the previous taverns video. Also, I found these swirling little spherical beads. They don't even need to be painted. Some nice little variation there. So all this is attached with white glue, not super glue, in order to prevent clouding. Takes a little longer to dry, but man, is it stronger and looks so much better. Assembly is a zen thing. It's my favorite part of the project. 
I'm just imagining these shelves busting and bristling with goodies, and I'm throwing in some candles and books from previous videos as well. I will reiterate this tip. After white gluing on all your features to furniture, then apply a final wash of a light tone. That tone is going to pool up and build around all of the contact area of the things on the table and just create ambient occlusion, a little bit of a shadow. It's going to make it look a little more tied together. I cannot understate how big a difference this makes in person. Now to build that orrery, going to need some costume jewelry, going to need some gears. The gears you can find on Amazon, there's a link in the video description below, easy free way to support me if you want. Costume jewelry you can find at yard sales, garage sales, that sort of thing, even the thrift store. Cheap costume jewelry. And paper clips, specifically the vinyl coated kind. They're strong and they paint well. So first I assembled a miniature orrery. I've got this little spherical earring and by putting a bit of paper clip through and then gluing on a gear and mounting that with a toothpick to another gear, boom, I've got a nice little practice piece. In fact, I was going to put this on the wizard's desk, but I ended up using it in the main orrery later on. Anyone who goes to church might recognize this. It's a communion elements disposable thing, so uh, I took this out of church, and I'm going to use it as the main body of the orrery. And here's a ping pong ball. Also, an orange juice lid. It's got those classic gothic arches. I'm using card stock circles to cover up the logo and build up the base here. And I'm imagining that there'll be a hand wheel to crank and turn this thing. So I've got a gear protruding from the middle. Then on another layer, I have a tongue depressor, a popsicle stick to stick out and mount that miniature orrery to. And at this point, I've started thinking about angles of viewing. I want this thing to look good from multiple angles. So all the different elements need to stick out crazy and not be concentrated in one place or at one angle. For the main disc, I could not find any leftover junk that would work, like a miniature frisbee or something, so I just made one. I drew out two discs on cardstock, and then these are kebab skewers, thin wooden dowels basically. One of them is going to go across the middle and be the main axis, but to create the bulk in the rest of the ring, I just used bits of that same skewer and glue pieces in there. Cutting more of that cardstock in thin strips to cover up the gap. This is a pain, it does not need to be perfect. It's going to be covered up mostly later on. Doing only the inside first, and I'm leaving open the two little spots where the main axis pole needs to go through. Prep the ping pong ball with holes, and the axis goes in one side, through the ping pong ball, and to the other side. And now, in this configuration, the outer cladding can be put on, and the whole thing is sealed in. Then I cut two more larger cardstock rings. The outer diameter is larger and the inner is smaller. This will cover up that ugliness where the cladding meets the first rings. And it'll create a nice channel on the outside that we can paint a different color and maybe mount things in. Then I just pulled out all of my little beads drawers and started brainstorming, experimenting with different combinations, using Google image search, looking for inspiration. Beads, gems, rocks, it's all good. With pin vise, I drilled a hole in that plastic communion element and glued in a paper clip that I formed into sort of a arm to hold a crystal moon. But first, here's another bit of costume jewelry. I'm just going to clean out the inside. It's already concave, so it fits on the ping pong ball center pretty nicely. Here are some clear quartz spherical beads, again from the crafting store. And I'm just going to glue one of these to a gear to make a little planetoid or a moon. Then more sitting and thinking and brainstorming, slowly attaching more doodads and beads and designs and stuff. You really can't go wrong with an orrery. It was starting to really come together. And I found this, this little piece here is from an LED Christmas ball like thing. The ball was made up of like a hundred of these. It stopped working years ago, but I saved it. I'm glad I did. I tore it out of the fixture and this will make a good like star thing, but I'm not gonna attach it just yet. Here's an earring. It's got curves, so that's fun. Also, my miniature orrery and the main disc both rotate, but they stay in place due to friction. This is an unintended bonus. Nice. Painting. The airbrush is going into overtime. Army Painter Metallic Golds. Got to love them. Gold over the entire piece. Then I took a dark metallic copper and just picked out some bits. Did not think about it. Went with the flow. Don't sweat it too much. I just knew that I wanted some contrast, so like all the gears, I made them darker or silver. And decals. Of course, I had to stop and look for some arcane decals. 40k Eldar. That transfer sheet is a gold mine, and I will keep exploiting it until the sun goes down. And then some surfaces I painted with a nice rich brown. Just break up the onslaught of metallics a little bit here. 
Then the magic serum, Army Painter Flesh Wash. The ultimate way to enrichify your golds. Love this stuff. I slathered a coat over the entire piece indiscriminately, even the silver bits. And from earlier in my losing time sessions, I had assembled a couple of these bead fixtures. I decided to go with a green motif. I think that complements gold well. It's also time to attach the other stuff, just with simple Elmer's white glue and a bit of patience. And then the orrery was done. Let's get some close-ups of the orrery before I take you to the full laid out laboratory. Does anyone remember Bugenhagen from Final Fantasy VII in the Cosmo Canyon section? If you know, you know. That scene is pretty much imprinted into my memory as one of the most fantastical and incredible moments in video gaming that I had ever experienced, and still have. I don't know what it is, but something about a good orrery just sets my imagination on fire. If you have crafter's block, I highly encourage you to make an orrery. Incredibly fun, very rewarding, and it will break the levy for you. I also enjoyed the miniature challenge I set for myself of making it functionally sensible. Not just chucking a bunch of gears on it, but for example that hand wheel shows how the device would actually be used. And I didn't mention this before, but of course, don't forget to bejewel it. Since today's topic is that of wizard's lairs, while I show you some of them, I'll read to you a bit about a famous Dungeons & Dragons wizard, Halaster Blackcloak, the Mad Mage. More than a thousand years ago, the wizard Halaster Blackcloak journeyed from a distant land to the base of Mount Waterdeep, perhaps acceding to the whispered summons of Providence. Some believe he hailed from the nearly forgotten empire known as the Cradle Lands. In ages past, Humanity spread from the Cradle Lands across Faerun, originating from what is now the, the Plains of Purple Dust, a wasteland birthed out of a conflict with the gods. Others give Halaster less ancient origins, placing him among the early wizards of Netheril, or asserting that he came from a southern nation long since buried by sand and time. Whatever his origin, scholars have recorded that Halaster brought with him seven apprentices to Mount Waterdeep. With the seven guarding his back, Halaster tapped into his immense power to summon beings from other planes of existence to help him build a wizard's tower to dwarf all other wizard's towers. But as the seasons wore on, the Seven saw less and less of their enigmatic master. Halaster continued to use fell creatures from distant planes for tunneling and other construction beneath his tower, and the wizard kept the nature of most of his underground dealings a secret from the Seven. Eventually, Halaster's exploration broke into the Underhalls, a complex of tunnels and rooms built by the dwarves around a mithril mine beneath Mount Waterdeep. The architects of the Underhalls, the Malarkin clan, had long ago been killed or dispersed, and warring Duragar and Drow had settled in the ruins. Halaster began a crusade against both the Drow and the Duragar, participating in wild hunts with extraplanar allies through the tunnels. The stubborn Duergar dug in until the Mithril was largely mined out, then they abandoned the Underhalls, leaving the Drow to fight Halaster and his minions alone. The Mad Mage rounded up the remaining Dark Elves, trapping some of their souls for use in his dark magic, while twisting the bodies and enslaving the minds of others. Once he had wrung out the Drow of their usefulness, Halaster Blackcloak tunneled on, ever downward, indulging his inexplicable compulsion for delving deeper and deeper into the mountain. Using his underground complex as a base of operations, Halaster traveled to other plains and distant lands, collecting strange and dangerous creatures to live as prisoners, servants, or guardians in Undermountain. Populating and defending the dungeon became an obsession. Over time, the mage's preoccupation with Undermountain electrified his eccentricities and infused him with an air of unconcealable madness. Hey there, YouTube viewers. Go ahead and leave a comment with which piece was your favorite, if any. And thank you so much for watching today. Much appreciated. If this whole thing is somehow new to you, please find us on Facebook, the Tabletop Crafters Guild. Over 40,000 members, of which I am just one, making stuff for our tabletop gaming. I'm also on Patreon, and you can use my Amazon affiliate links below. Thanks for watching. I'm Wylock. Make things and play games. Music